Good morning. My name is Rabbi Chaim Beliak. I'm the uh, volunteer executive director of Friends of Jewish Renewal in Poland. Uh, we are pleased to present uh, with our partners in Poland, Beit Polska, a very important series uh, entitled Freighted Legacies. Uh, this is the 11th uh, program, a very important and exciting program in which we will have a discussion with Professor Łukasz uh, uh, Krzyżanowski. Uh, and uh, we are very pleased that he will be um, our expert uh, speaking about his book that appeared first in Polish uh, in 2016, and then um, in uh, English in uh, 2020. Uh, you can refer to the uh, website www.jewishrenewalinpoland uh, for uh, a link and a opportunity to acquire the book at a, a bit of a discount. I'm pleased to uh, welcome uh, Professor Krzyzanowski um, with um, a board member of Friends of Jewish Renewal in Poland, um, Professor David Cater. Uh, retired uh, from Arizona State University uh, School of Law. Um, and uh, uh, Professor Cater will be uh, co-hosting along with our um, program director who um, is located uh, in Chicago, uh, the, the largest Polish uh, city in the world, um, Dominika uh, Zakaszewska. Um, the three of us will be uh, the voices that you hear in English, um, but you will also, if you are uh, listening, want to choose um, Polish, and you can do that um, if, if, you're, if that's your language by looking at the bottom of your screen and finding a little globe that has the word interpretation and choosing the language that is the best language for you. Uh, one other note on how to uh, manage things is that we will have a period of uh, uh, questions and answers. And we suggest that you use for your questions, uh, chat. Uh, again, welcome to uh, Freighted Legacies. Uh, after uh, the lecture, we will share with you our upcoming uh, programs. Um, and um, this program today takes uh, place uh, with all of us conscious of um, the uh, terrible invasion of Ukraine by uh, Russia. Uh, and uh, expression of solidarity um, uh, for the Ukrainian people um, who are uh, being um, attacked. Um, I'd like to now turn to um, uh, Dominika Zakraszewska uh, for you to receive uh, greetings uh, uh, from Beit Polska. Witamy Państwa serdecznie na kolejnym webinarze z serii to Legacies. Cieszymy się bardzo, że webinary cieszą się coraz większą popularnością i mamy coraz więcej osób dołączających, które są zainteresowane prezentowanymi tematami. Witamy Państwa w imieniu Beit Polska, Związku Postępowych Gmin Żydowskich w Polsce oraz Fundacji Friends of Jewish Renewal in Poland z Los Angeles. Mamy nadzieję, że... Również ten webinar spotka się z Państwa tak dużym zainteresowaniem jak poprzednie. Jeżeli chcą Państwo słuchać webinaru w języku polskim, na dolnym pasku narzędzi znajdą Państwo możliwość opcji tłumaczenia. Należy wtedy wybrać opcję języka polskiego. Zachęcamy również do zadawania pytań zarówno w trakcie, jak i po zakończeniu prezentacji. Jeżeli pytania pojawią się w trakcie, proszę wpisywać je w głównym czacie. Wtedy w odpowiednim momencie będziemy robić przerwę i zadawać pytania tak, żeby mogli Państwo na pewno uzyskać na nie odpowiedzi. Zapraszamy serdecznie na prezentację. Uh, now it's uh, my uh, pleasure to say a few more words about our uh, speaker, the author of the book, Ghost Citizens, a Jewish Return to Post-War City, um, in this case, the city of Radom. Um, Professor Krzyzanowski is 
um, a member of the Polish Academy of Sciences in Warsaw. He's been a postdoctorate uh, fellow at the University of Berlin, uh, University of Ox Oxford, and has also um, worked at Yad Vashem. Uh, as I stated earlier, his book, uh, Go Citizens, Jewish Return to a Post-War City, was first published in Poland in 2016 and by Harvard Press in English in 2020. Um, the rare documents upon which um, much of the research is based on uh, are an important glimpse at the period right after World War II um, that uh, uh, was faced by Jews returning to the cities that they had come from and attempting to uh, take up their lives once again. And um, as a child of survivors, um, doing what uh, my mother and many other survivors uh, from Poland tried to do, which was to see if someone uh, had somehow remained alive, if there were family members that they could reunite with, um, and uh, at least attempting to uh, reestablish themselves. So this is a rare account uh, based on documents, based on the fact that um, Professor Krzysztofowski is uh, from Radom, and um, we look forward to his presentation, and then we'll have a response by Professor Kader. Uh, Professor Krzysztofowski, welcome to Freighted Legacies. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to Rabbi Beliak and Professor Kader for your very kind invitation. It's a real pleasure and honor to to be part of this program and to be able to present my research and the recent book. It is estimated that uh, 425,000 Polish Jews survived the Holocaust and um, approximately half of that number attempted to settle in Poland after Second World War. They were returning from Nazi forced labor and concentration camps from hiding places and later from the USSR. Many settled in a few Polish big cities, that is Warsaw, Łódź, Krakow, and Western territories, uh, Wrocław, Szczecin, the biggest cities, but also in the surrounding areas. Numerous survivors attempted to return to smaller localities across Poland, to the places that they originated from. After all, the desire to return home is a very natural human emotion. Most of these people did, were not yet aware of the extent of the destruction of Jewish families and communities. They also did not expect the difficulties and dangers they were about to face upon their return. They were hoping to find surviving relatives. Others desired to start their lives anew in the landscapes with which they were familiar. In 2008, I worked as an assistant researcher to, for Anne Applebaum, an American uh, journalist and Pulitzer Prize winner. Uh, on, that, on one of the assignments, I traveled to, to Radom uh, State Archive, where I discovered a collection of documents created by the District Jewish Committee in that city. Radom is a medium-sized city in central Poland. Like other localities, it witnessed survivors return or attempts to return. Um, I should rather say, but not, let's not jump to the very con conclusion of this talk. On, in August 1950, on the eighth anniversary of the deportation of, um, of the vast majority of the inhabitants of the two ghettos in the city, the, the District Jewish Committee and Community of Survivors unveiled a monument. It was the last time in history of the city that the Jewish dwellers of Radom appeared together in public and acted as a community. This monument uh, still marks the, uh, the, the space in the city. It stands on the, in, on the square where, where the city's synagogue used to, used to be and which was demolished after, which survived the war and was demolished only a few, day, few years later. The monument is 
is a reminder of two communities, the one that perished and the one that, that made the effort to build it, namely the survivors. The latter community is the main focus of my book. Before the war, Radom had a population of around 90,000 inhabitants. It was an industrial city uh, known primarily for its leather production, but also a state-owned armaments factory and many smaller private owned, privately owned factor, factory plants. One third of the population of the city was Jewish. There was a significant, within this one third, there was a significant proportion of Orthodox and Hasidic people Jews were contributing to shaping the city. Jews were on the city council. They were business owners. They were active in trades as trade as elsewhere in pre-war Poland. There was also a Jewish middle class. There were physicians, lawyers, um, and engineers. Therefore, Jews contributed to the economic, political, and cultural life of the city. They were also discriminated against as elsewhere in Poland. And I would argue that the distance between the Christian majority and Jewish minority increased over the years and turned into a chasm during the World War II. The German occupation of, uh, of Poland placed Radom in the center of the general government, a semi-colonial political entity Radom was the capital of one of the four and later five districts of the general government. The course of the Holocaust in, in Radom uh, was very typical for, uh, for localities uh, that were in the center of the general government. A, there were two Jewish ghettos established in the city in spring of 1941, one in the city center in the uh, area that was before the, even before the war uh, occupied primarily by the, uh, by the Jewish population. And the other one uh, on the outskirts of the, uh, of the city more um, both industrial and 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 an impoverished uh, area, the uh, more rural rural area, the suburbs, uh, called Glinice. Uh, the conditions in in those two ghettos were very difficult and increasingly de increasingly deteriorating, uh, but they were not as uh, terrible as uh, in the Warsaw ghetto. The two ghettos were liquidated. Uh, in two extremely brutal deportation actions in August 1942. The majority of Radom Jews was murdered in the Treblinka death camp. After that summer, the summer of 1942, only a few Jews remained in the city, and these were the slave workers in the camp attached to the armaments factory. The city was liberated by the Red Army in January 1945. First survivors were emerging in the city just hours or days after the liberation. A few weeks after the liberation, almost 300 Jewish survivors registered in the city. They immediately started to organize themselves. They created a Jewish committee, an institution. Such institutions uh, were existing or were, were being created by survivors in, in many other places across Poland. Like many of the committees that were created spontaneously, the Radom Committee soon became a district branch of the Central Committee of Jews in Poland, which was based in Warsaw. The Jewish Committee was um, fulfilling several, um, several needs. It was representing uh, survivors in, in contact with the authorities. It obtained food, food supplies and clothing for the survivors. It was registering survivors arriving in the city, which was both very important for justifying their needs in front of the authorities when they were requ requesting, for example, food supplies. But it was also important for survivors themselves because those who were coming to the city 
could look at the list and see whether somebody of the, from the relatives or friends had survived and returned to the city. They were also offering aid to survivors. Um, it, there was little financial aid, but, uh, but it was very, uh, very important uh, for those who were, uh, for, for, the, for, the, for most of the uh, survivors were, were penniless and, and, still, uh, when, and still wearing camp clothes when arriving in the city. They, um, they also, um, the, the committee uh, in Radom um, for a short period uh, also provided basic uh, medical assistance. Um, they, they run a surgery. They also run a night shelter, a place where, where those who were returning to the city could, or were passing through the city, could stay overnight uh, and get uh, a hot meal. And also a very important, um, important, important um, Thing, especially for those who were uh, passing through the city in winter uh, of 1945. And as you know, Polish winters can be, can be quite harsh, not like the, 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 the winter we have these days. Um, but the committee fulfilled also another need. It, all, it, it provided a basic sense of community. Most of the survivors did not have any surviving relatives. And also, soon after the arrival in the city, they became targets of hostility and violence carried out by the local non-Jewish population. So being together was a very important, uh, an important thing. There were seven Jews that were murdered in the city uh, in 1945. Most recent, and obviously, those murders happened in, in many other in cities and, and villages across Poland. The most recent research estimates that a total, a total number of survivors killed by Poles between July 1944 and the end of 1947 can be placed at approximately 1,100. But the killings were just the tip of the iceberg. There was verbal abuse, institutional discrimination, and less deadly acts of physical violence that the uh, survivors had to cope with uh, on a daily basis. I would argue that this is, that it was not only deeply rooted and widespread antisemitism that was standing behind those acts, but also the fact that the Jews were the most vulnerable group in post-war Poland. They paid a high price for the communist regime's struggle to obtain leg legitimacy among masses of Polish society in which anti-Semitic resentments were common. In other words, the communists when, were reluctant to, to provide uh, sufficient protection for the Jewish minority because they knew that uh, then once they start protecting Jews, they will, they will be dubbed as Jewish, uh, Jewish authorities, not Polish authorities. And the communists obviously wanted to, to be recognized by the majority of the uh, country's population of Polish authorities. Between 1945 and 1949, the District Jewish Committee in Radom registered nearly uh, 1,800 survivors. The number of survivors actually residing in the city, however, at any given time after the war, have, has not ex uh, did not exceed a few hundred. It was a community on the move, which was very typical for um, for the for entire population of Poland in the immediate after aftermath of the Second World War, but it's even more true for the Jewish, uh, Jewish survivors. The community of survivors in Radom was most numerous in the summer of 1945. The murder of four survivors that took place in August 1945 triggered the biggest wave of Jewish departures from the city. And this facilitates the argument, this fact facilitates the argument that locally perpetrated violence played an important role in people's decisions to leave. 
contrary to what, what many people think, that the Kielce pogrom was the, the uh, single event that, that pushed most of the Jews out from Poland, from Radom. When the Kielce pogrom of, of July 1946 took place, there, were, there was hardly anyone to leave uh, to, to, to leave Radom because there were very few Jews living in the city at the time. Most of them left the city in the summer of 1945. Some survivors, nevertheless, some survivors decided to stay uh, despite the violence and difficult conditions of life. They formed a community that was very different from those that existed in big Polish cities or in Western territories. The district Jewish committee was at the center of this community. The attempts to establish religious congregation and local branches of Zionist organizations were unsuccessful. The, before the war, there were several Jewish newspapers published in the city, obviously after the war, the community was not able to, to recreate any of those uh, or revive any of those um, cultural um, and um, cultural activities. The survival community in, in Radom was small, constantly changing due to those um, coming and going, the survivors arriving in the city and living in the city. And it was also conflict driven It was unable to create institutions sufficiently powerful to became partners with the local authorities. As a result, Jews were almost invisible in the post-war city. They had no impact on local politics, not even in matters pertaining directly to the Jews. Many survivors never returned to social roles and occupations they had been active in before the war. They return in social sense turned out to be impossible. Therefore, I use the phrase ghost citizens to de describe those survivors, for, for, for it aptly conveys the, the, the situation in which physical presence of Jews did not bring with it their participation in social life of the city. This, however, does not mean that the survivors of the Holocaust in Radom were passive victims or remained apathetic in relation to their surrounding reality. On the contrary, there were active subjects. The rebirth of Jewish community in its pre-war shape turned out to be impossible. The survivors created a small and isolated community while attempting to rebuild Jewish life, their institutions and networks in the city. They did so against all odds they did um, to, uh, despite, they, they did so to, despite the complicated social, political, and legal reality to which they had returned. The reconstruction of social ties and institutions, as well as efforts to recover property that had belonged to them or their murdered relatives, support this assertion. Jewish survivors manifested their agency and desire to take control of their own lives. My book addresses a fundamental question he'd heard a, had to glossed over by contemporary scholarship. That is, who were these people and what was their day-to-day -day experience in provincial Poland immediately, immediately after the genocide? Using all available sources and documents from the archives located on three continents, I build a picture of the community uh, and the most important source of these documents that uh, Rabbi Beliak mentioned at the, um, during the introduction is a collection of, Jew of district Jewish committee documents that survived by a fluke and was found in, by, in a shed on the outskirts of the city by the uh, pol political secret police in only in 1974. I pursue an in-depth, using those documents, I pursue an in-depth study of everyday life of survivors, their 
interactions with non-Jewish population of the city and the authorities, as well as Jewish agency is manifested in attempts to recover property and rebuild the community. It is a, prof a pr I, I would argue that the profound study of these issues is possible only through a micro historical lens. However, the sweeping implications of such inquiry go far beyond the local context. Thank you very much uh, for your attention and I'm ready to take the questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Wukash. Uh, uh, if I may presume to call you by your first name. Um, my uh, uh, desire now is to turn to my uh, uh, colleague, uh, David Cater, who um, is going to respond uh, to uh, his visit uh, uh, to Radom uh, with you and his reading of the book. Uh, and we're inviting questions from people. Um, and uh, thank you very much for your enlightening uh, introduction. Um, there are many th stories you didn't tell yet, so we're going to drag them out of you, and people will also have to read. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, David? Yes, thank you, Rabbi. Uh, let me begin by first thanking Lukash uh, in two ways. First, for this remarkable book. Um, if I had the uh, emotional stamina, I would read it again. Uh, but as he knows, and you know, Rabbi, uh, my mother's from Rodham, and I embraced this book as soon as it came out. And so I thank him for uh, this labor. It, it, it's an extraordinary read. I also want to thank him uh, virtually again for giving of his time when my wife, who you maybe can see in the background in this image, and myself and colleague Anya uh, uh, were in Rodham. And he was kind enough to give us a substantial portion of a day uh, and showed us around and identified many important locations uh, in the city. And we even had a, a, a dinner uh, together. So uh, those, that was a very meaningful and important uh, experience uh, for us. And I'm grateful to him still uh, for that uh, time. There, as the rabbi said, there are many questions, but I would like to begin sort of at the macro level and then, if time permits, dive into some specifics. So my first question is, how has Poland and your Polish readers, assuming there are many, responded to your book? I ask because of the many pieces of literature, fiction, nonfiction that I have read, uh, about the Holocaust that is set by either Polish writers or in Poland that has any level of what I would call criticism or a narrative that speaks of Polish complicity in Jewish suffering either before the war, and let alone in your book after the war, has received pretty strong pushback, as I understand. Certainly Neighbors, the book Neighbors by Jan Gross some years ago, is probably at the pinnacle of that example. So I would be interested in knowing uh, your experience once your book uh, became available to the Polish uh, community in Poland. Thank you. Thank you very much for this question. Um, as you, uh, as, as it was mentioned at the beginning, the, uh, the first edition of the, uh, book in Polish was published in 2016. And, uh, and I must say that the reception was pretty, uh, pretty um, good. It was, it was uh, well reviewed in, um, in various um, newspapers and journals. Uh, it received also a, uh, two, um, two important uh, price, uh, prizes. Uh, one was the, um, the history, um, a, a, an award for, for, a, for a book in history that I received in Warsaw, but another one which was, which was also very important um, and was personally also important that it, was, uh, it received a literary, uh, a literary award of the city of Radom for academic 
and academic and, and popular uh, academic books, which, uh, which I found as a recognition of the, um, not only of the importance of the book, which you know, obviously every author is flattered to receive an award, but I, I found it as a, as a recognition of the, uh, of the importance of the topic and the community that I wrote about. But to, the, uh, to add a, a grain of salt to what I said, um, the city of Radom created a, a, <clears throat> a series of the memorial plaques in the city, which tells the story of the, it's, it's called the, the trail of the memory of the, uh, in, a, in the memory of the, of the Radom Jews, which the, the plaques were not in the place, I believe, where, where, where you visited the city. Uh, yet, and the um, there is no plaque that would uh, that would commemorate the existence of the Jewish community after the, after the war, and um, and when I petitioned the city, I, I wrote a letter to the to the uh, mayor and the uh, head of the, the then head of the of the local cultural center that was uh, that was uh, about to unveil this uh, this trail. They, um, they I, did, I have not received any response from the mayor and the head of the cultural center uh, wrote uh, that uh, it's impossible to, to commemorate everything and the uh, places where the plaques will be placed were discussed with the experts. So, uh, so even though the, 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 um, the place and the building that was the, at the center of the Jewish survivor community for, for almost five years in the city uh, after the war is not commemorated and there is absolutely no mentioning of this, uh, of this committee. Uh, permit me to follow up uh, sort of at the other end of my uh, range of questions without the rabbi will tell me if I'm taking too much time. Um, right ahead. One of the uh, most powerful moments in our visit with you, and it was in your second image, I believe, that you showed us in your talk, was of the uh, area that used to be the synagogue. Mm -hmm. And what was striking, other than the erosion of the monument uh, by weathering over the many years since it was built in the 40s, was the fact that it's still sort of an empty space. And so my question is, what is the status, uh, if you know, of that particular piece of land? Uh, who owns it? Is there any movement to do anything with it? Not to mention the large structure on the central square, uh, which we walked by, which we have, through the archives, uh, have determined where my mother actually uh, was in right during the ghetto period, at least. So I'm, I'm curious about these structures, that building, for example, and where the synagogue used to be that remains, what to say, uh, seemingly untouched for some 70 years. And so I'm curious, and there are other structures you showed us that had similar uh, abeyance. They, I would call them ghost properties. Uh, to echo your phrase, go citizens. So I, I'm curious uh, if you know uh, why that has continued so. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I, I just uh, realized I would like to add something to my, in my previous answer is that um, I think the reason, one of the reasons why the book was pretty well received and even reviewed in uh, it, it got a, a very positive review from, from a, a moderately right-wing Catholic uh, weekly, uh, and and I think that the the reason why uh, why it was uh, was well received was the fact that I I did my best to to make my readers able to empathize with the uh, with uh, with the um, main characters of the book or the the people that I wrote the book about. So uh, so, and I think that that's the key um, key issue to to make people think about the history of the Holocaust here in Poland. And I use it very often when I work with the students. That once you once you uh, feel empathetic to the to the people you study, 
uh, it's much more difficult to to reject their experience, even if this experience shows your own group in a very um, difficult light or in a very very dark light, I would say, or, or dark places it places it in in a, in a dark position. A the the square where the monument well the monument was uh, is taken care of by the city and um, and it, and and I I think it looks a little bit better than the than when it when 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 you visited it because the city um, rearranged the, um, the 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 square and and did some some maintenance work on the on the monument itself. I just you know used applied paint on the on the railings and but uh, but it's true that the the vicinity of the monument is uh, is um, is surrounded by ruins and the fact the reason why is that um, as as you know uh, but people in the in the public may not not, not know it the the uh, the place where the synagogue used to be and the, where the monument is now uh, was at the heart of the Radom, of the main Radom ghetto and as i said in, during my talk the uh, the this large Radom ghetto was created in the area that was populated before the war uh, even before the war was po populated primarily by the uh, jewish population and so were the um, the owners of the of these houses they were jewish and and um, most of them did not survive the war so the uh, so uh, that brings us to the, to another topic covered in my book that is the the jewish property the fate of the jewish pop property in the post-war period that became um de facto um, uh, state-owned and uh and those houses were um, used for communal housing uh, for last uh, 70 years. Um, and, um, and nobody really um, took care of those houses and to the extent that some of the, uh, some of the um, large houses uh, were, were not, not demolished, they, they, they collapsed themselves in the um, so the the main uh, the main street of the of the Radom ghetto, which is just just one block from the uh, from 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 where the monument stands, uh, is looking differently. Um, it's looking very different today than it was uh, it was even ten or twenty years ago. Uh, and definitely, if you look at the, I, I looked a yeah, couple of days ago, I looked at the pictures, I looked at with my students at the pictures of, the, of those streets, um, you know, the main street of the ghetto. And then I, uh, I looked at the uh, pictures that were taken in 1960s. Um, half of these uh, uh, buildings does not exist anymore. And uh, another half of the existing half is in a state that, uh, that uh, without any maintenance, it will collapse within the next 10 years. So that's, um, that's uh, uh, and obviously, uh, it, and it happens in, in many, uh, many um, Polish cities. Uh, the, um, the areas of the former ghettos were populated with people who were uh, often impoverished, uh, um, uh, often, um, uh, well, it, those people who, set, who were settled in these houses, in the communal houses, were not the elite, to put it mildly. So, um, so that's, that, that also contributes to the state in which this uh, neighborhood is. You know, it also occurs to me in your book, uh, while it is heavily devoted to careful archival work, uh, very granular, uh, extraordinary, actually, in my view, uh, what is sort of very special as well, and you note it right in your opening lines of your acknowledgement, is that you also interviewed some approximately, I would guess, 30 survivors. And you know uh, better than I, I'm sure, how problematic, at least in uh, historiography and scholarship, it is to uh, capture historical events by such interviews 
given issues of memory and so forth and so on. I, I, I'd like you to share with us, if you can, that experience, uh, how the survivors responded to you, given your interests, how defensive or open, to what extent you may have been able to corroborate statements. Uh, and I don't, by this question, want to diminish the importance of the survivor testimonies, as more and more survivors, as you know, leave us. Uh, but it's an extraordinary part of the book, and it's one of the aspects of the book that uh, I was very impressed by, that you made the effort to find survivors and talk to them, some in person, some by phone, as I understand it. But your experience in doing that and how it affected uh, your, uh, uh, your work, uh, because you mentioned in your earlier response how you, sent, you sought to um, humanize uh, the community that returned to Rodham. And I wonder how much this interview process helped you in that regard. Oh, thank you very much. Well, I, I didn't need to humanize those people for myself. So, uh, and also it's a, one of the biggest difference in working on the English edition of the book was that I, I was aware that I don't need to, to, uh, to humanize those people to the American audience. Uh, and I, I see that on the, on the chat, uh, Chuck Fishman, whose photos I, I, I admire, I uh, mentioned the book uh, Anton the Dove Fencer by uh, Bernard Gottfried, uh, whose, um, whose photograph, uh, who was a photo, professional photographer, whose photograph just um, you can see at the, at the corner of, of the screen, it's in my studio, and who was one of the, of the survivors I interviewed. And actually, it's the, the fact that Bernard's uh, photograph uh, or photograph by him as, uh, is hanging on the wall of my of my uh, studio is is is, uh, is telling about uh, the approach or the the attitude of the of the uh, survivor uh, survi most most of the survivors that I was able to access. Um, I, as as you know, the book is not is not based on the interviews. Uh, the the interviews were very important for the creation of this book and were very important uh, for myself and for understanding the documents and the reality uh, about which I was learning uh, when I was going through the archival sources. But, uh, but um, and so the meetings with these uh, survivors were, were much more important than its uh, evidence in the uh, references in my book or the, uh, the, uh, the um, number of uses of those interviews or uh, direct quotations from the interviews I do in the, in, in the book. Uh, many of the, uh, of the uh, survivors were, were surprised that I want to talk about, about the post-war period because, uh, because um, Quite a number of, the, of those people were, were already used to were, were used to uh, talking and telling people about their uh, wartime experience. And the uh, the post-war period for many of them was just a the post-war period in, in Poland was just a um, a sort of um, interlanding between the Holocaust and the real life they, they got somewhere else than in Poland uh, after they emigrated from Poland. Because most of those people I interviewed in, um, I, I actually wonder whether I met anyone. I think I, maybe I interviewed one or, or two people in, in, in Poland, but most of them I interviewed in, uh, in Israel, in the United States, in France, in Canada. Uh, in um, in many different um, countries, but not in Poland. So uh, so for them coming back to the um, to this 1945 1946 was was a strange, I believe it was a strange exercise, um, because they were they were from Radom and they they knew when I introduced myself that I also I was born in Radom. I don't live there for the most of my life. I don't live there. 
uh, but um, but the first until I was I mean late teenage years I was living in Radom, so they immediately asked me about the uh, school and school that I, the high school that I graduated from, and uh, Radom has uh, a few uh, high schools that are uh, the dates uh, that the creation of those high schools uh, dates back to the um, interwar period or even earlier. And um, unfortunately, I didn't graduate from any of these high schools, but my brother and my father and my grandfather graduated from, from those schools. So, that, so, so the, uh, a, a short uh, question about which, which, uh, which uh, high school I graduated from, uh, I turned into a, a, telling a brief story of my family education because I, I knew I cannot legitimize myself by telling the, the name of the school that I graduated, that myself, I, I myself graduated from. Um, I met with a one um, refusal to, uh, to be interviewed. Uh, and I don't really know the reasons. Um, I met with the person later because the person, so I, it, it usually, um, it was finding contacts with these people was sometimes difficult. Sometimes it was um, what sociologists would call a snowball sample. So I was finding one person and then they were calling the other people. So this person that refused the interview did not have contact to me because they refused, so we didn't exchange contacts. But they knew who referred them to me, so they called the person that referred referred them to me, uh, me to them, and asked for my phone. And a week or two weeks later, I received a, a phone call inviting me to to make that, telling that you know, I. I I think I did a mistake. I want to. I want to be interviewed, and we met. I don't know what was the reason for the initial refusal, but but uh, but the person allowed to, to to be interviewed. There was also another person that in Canada that um, that I wanted to interview. Uh, the person said that uh, she really wants to meet with me because I was um, I was recommended. Uh, or, or I was, I was, I was a grad at the time. I was a graduate student from of someone she knew uh, from early life. So, so, um, so, uh, but, but she said when we were fixing the meeting, she said that we don't. You won't ask any question. I want. I don't want to talk about it. I just want to meet with you. And then we started having a very nice lunch. And she said that she feels comfortable, ask questions. And so we, 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 we talked. Obviously there was no, there was no time and no, um, no uh, space for taking, a, taking, a voice rec uh, taking out a voice recorder and recording the talk. So I, I did my best to, to write down everything after, immediately after I left the, the house. But, um, <clears throat> but, those meetings were important, and uh, and I am very grateful. I started my research at a time when they were possible, because I believe that today it would be it would be very difficult. I I occasionally meet survivors, uh, but as you know, this group is um, the number the number of people in this group increases very rapidly uh, these years. Well, uh, you, Lukash, I know I could take up the rest of our time together, but I mustn't because I know there are many questions on the chat and others would like to ask you. So I will uh, voluntarily against my preference and desire uh, stop asking you questions. But um, again, thank you for all that you've done uh, on this project and for giving your time with us today. And if I could just add one other thought, one of the remarkable things about the book for me is we use the word survivor a lot, but there's a sense of agency mm -hmm. among a large population of Jews that remained in Rodham, created that district Jewish committee, tried to set up that memorial. All of that labor, even in the best of circumstances is difficult. And in that circumstance seems to me almost impossible. So I, I, I 
thank you for that, for underscoring the feature of agency, of self-reliance and the rest beyond survivorship. And thank you so much once again, and I hope uh, we will meet in person and not just virtually sometime in the future. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Uh, let me thank you, uh, David. Uh, your uh, last remark and the, the, the question that uh, uh, Wukash was answering uh, is um, uh, echoed in uh, the question that is being asked by a scholar of Yiddish theater, um, uh, Nama Sandro, um, who says, how do you explain the survivors who stuck it out and stayed in Radon? And in this instance, Wukash, uh, I want to refer to one of the pictures you showed us um, and actually um, complain that you didn't show us the other picture of the Passover Seder, which is on page 128 of your book, where um, you see a very bare bones a gathering of people uh, at uh, Seder. And you in the text point out the people in military uniforms wearing the various campaign ri ribbons. And I think that uh, that is part of the story of who was in Radom, why did they come back? What were they attempting to do? Uh, please, if you could respond. Thank you. Uh, well, I think, uh... As uh, if I understand the question correctly, this is more about those who decided to stay for a longer, a longer time than just uh, while passing on the on, uh, through the city. And the picture of the cellar that I showed, and the other which is in the book, is is a series of two photos uh, taken by the same person. The difference is only that the some of the soldiers sit in the different places and on one photo they have their headwear and on the other hand they don't but it's, it's the same the same uh, roughly basically the same picture uh, is uh, was taken in uh, on Seder in 1945 so most of those people are uh, it's it's uh, it's uh, the moment when the uh, community was still growing and some of those soldiers, as I tried to, um, to figure out who took this picture, it turned out that the original of this picture is in the Yad Vashem archive. And it's the collection of somebody who came from Shasnish, a city which is nowhere near Radom, uh, but the person was a soldier. And he was uh, apparently he was stationed or or uh, in the city or was passing through the city at the moment um, the seder took place and he participated and he took those two pictures in Radom and those two pictures are there is a, a collection of photos that he took on his way to Pshasnish and these are the only photos he took in Radom. So, uh, so this is uh, so. Um, so, although it's a very nice picture showing many people, it's not a picture of the of the uh, of the um, we would say uh, you know a, a core of the community of those who stayed, or even those that stayed after the killings took place in 1945, and uh, those who, uh, who, who stayed, uh, regardless of the violence and the threats that they were receiving, the, the difficulties and the discrimination that they were facing, well, um, it, would, it, it won't be an exaggeration to say that 99% uh, of those people were uh, somehow connected to Radom before the war. They were either born in Radom or they lived in Radom before the war. I actually compared two registration lists from the, uh, by the committee of the survivors in uh, early 1945 and in late 1946, so after the Kielce pogrom. And obviously you can see there, there are two very visible processes when you compare those lists. One is the uh, one is the fact that most of the survivors are driven out of the city, which is which I already addressed in my talk. And another uh, another uh, another change is that a uh, in the early 1945, those who are in Radom are originating from 
many places. Roughly, we can divide, divide them in three groups. One group, the first group, um, and they are similar in size. Uh, the first group would be uh, those who were originating from Radon. Second group would be those who originate from in whose um, hometowns were in the vicinity of Radon, in the, well, I don't know, approximately in the distance of not more than 100 kilometers or 70. 100 kilometers would be also worse, so 70 kilometers. I, and one and another one third of this group are those who originate from all over uh, pre-war Poland. Uh, there are people from Vilnius, there are people from Krakow, there are people from Warsaw, different places. This is uh, this is uh, early 1945. When you compare when I compared it to the list from late 1946 after Kielce pogrom, uh, I think almost 99 percent of those people. Are, uh, are those who had some pre-war connection to Radon. Uh, and that facilitates the argument that, that these were, this was the attempt, that those people really attempted to, to return, that they had something to return to. Uh, for many of them, it proved to be um, impossible to return. Uh, but, uh, but I think this the the, the question. I, if I if I read the uh, read the intentions of of somebody who asked it um, correctly, it's also there is also a, a question probably why they attempted to return, and I think it's um, I get this question pretty often. But I think it's very it's a very natural to to want to return, and uh, and when 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 we think about what they expected, and that and most of them expected that somebody survived. They, people were, were disconnected with their families uh, at different stages of the Holocaust. So they, they did not, didn't know that everyone was dead and they hoped that somebody survived. And the natural place where you would s search for, for a surviving member of the family would be place that you once called home. So, uh, so in other words, it's a very. I think it was very. It, it, it is a very natural phenomenon that the survivors of um, of, of the Holocaust uh, returned or appeared in 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 their original in the place of their origin after the war. M most of them. Uh, returned uh, very uh, for a very short time and and and, and were the were in the city uh, only temporary. Some of them stayed, and those who stayed, um, some of them stayed because it was it, it was much it was difficult for them to start a new somewhere else. And when you when I look at looked at the um, at the uh, occupational structure of the of those people who stayed, uh, many of them were uh, craftsmen, uh, and uh, and I argue that for craftsmen it's a very difficult it's it's more difficult to start in a new place than let's say for a, for a physician or an engineer or a worker. Because uh, obviously, physician and an engineer, they um, their strength is in what they their education, so they can start easily in a in a in a bigger city. Uh, the worker um, does not own the um, equipment that he works with, so uh, so he or she can start in working in a factory in any other place. And they were better places to start than Radon. Uh, but for craftsmen, they need the craftsmen. They need uh, to perform the craft. They need their work tools and they, they need their workshops. These were mostly before the war. These were mostly privately owned. Uh, Jews were very um, were highly represented in in craft uh, in Radon before the war, and only very few of them employed workers. They were 
oftentimes uh, family workshops that, that they were running, uh, small family workshops. And uh, I argue that some of them hoped that they will be able to recover this part of their pre-war lives. This obviously turned out uh, impossible. Uh, so the Jewish committee, uh, as any, as many other Jewish committees uh, across Poland, um, attempted to create uh, um, cooperatives, the, um, the places where they would, uh, the artisans could perform the crafts using work tools that they were obtained by, uh, by the Jewish committee. In case of Radom, these were the um, sewing machines uh, that they were um, Jewish owned before the war, that they were um, the owners of these machines were dispossessed by the Nazis. The, uh, the, the sewing machines were used by, uh, by German controlled uh, firm during the war. And, uh, and after the war, they became uh, in control, they came into control of the uh, municipality. So the Jewish committee actually rented the, uh, the uh, equipment that was Jewish owned before the war, rented the equipment from the, uh, from the state management. Um, but this was, uh, on one hand, this was the possible, it was an opportunity for the artisans to to start working, start working their craft, performing their craft. Uh, on the other hand, this was also a, an, a, an opportunity to create a, a sense of community for many of those artisans were not only working in the community, in the cooperatives, but they were also living in those cooperatives. And those four people that were murdered in Radom in August 1945, the, the single event that triggered the biggest wave of, of uh, survivor uh, leaving the city, survivors leaving the city, was actually, um, they were actually uh, murdered in a co cooperative uh, after ce celebrating um, a Shabbos dinner. So, uh, so the cooperatives were not only a workplaces. May I um, invite uh, Dominika if she would like to choose from um, among the many questions and remarks uh, to ask one, uh, we are moving towards our, the conclusion of our time. Uh, Dominica, please. Oh, there was, uh, there was a lot of uh, interesting question asked. And uh, the one that I'm actually wondering the most is, uh, uh, and which was repeated a few times uh, in the comments was uh, why actually people decided to come back? What was so important for them that they decided to risk and to come back to the place that seemed not to be uh, so secure at that time? Why this kind of a choice? Mm -hmm. I think, uh, well, partly we are still you know, going around the uh, similar uh, question here. I, so, but I will try to approach it from a different angle. Um, first, it was not safe for the Jews in any place in Poland, uh, at least not in the um, parts that, that, that were uh, in Poland before the war, because the, the, the area which was uh, safer were the lands that were, um, that were, that, um, the Western territories that Poland obtained only after the war that that had belonged to the uh, to uh, to Germany before uh, before September 19 before 1945, uh, and the reason why it was safer there uh, is um, there are multiple reasons. One is that it was uh, there everyone there was new. There was also no question of of Jewish property or not. The question of Jewish property was different in, in those lands because obviously there were there were Jewish owned properties before the war in these areas, but they all were owned by German Jews, not Polish Jews. So uh, so uh, any every any Polish citizens that was uh, that was um, uh, showing up uh, in those Western lands in 1945 1946 was was new to the to, to the land and. 
and uh, and this is one of the reasons why they were uh, why there were so uh, big communities in in these areas. Um, so so I think this deals with the part of the question why they returned even though it was it was uh, it was dangerous. Um, so anywhere in this part of Poland, in the central Poland, was dangerous for them. Obviously, the smaller localities were more dangerous than the big than the big cities. Um, but if you if you or your parents or siblings owned a property in the city um, and you wanted to recover it, uh, you it was much better if you showed up in the city. Uh, there was a procedure of doing it through the um, through representatives or um, or lawyers who were residing in Radom, but uh, but it was more difficult, um, more uh, time and cost consuming. So uh, so some of those uh, people uh, showed up to uh, to claim their property, and uh, many of them uh, did claim. Uh, some of them recovered uh, and. Uh, Virtually all of those who recovered immediately sold the uh, properties to non-Jews. So, and that this is uh, yet an, it is another argument of my book that even if the Jews were recovering the properties after the war, they, it still be, it still remained in the possession in non-Jewish hands because it was immediately sold because it was dangerous and the survivors. Did not want to live in Radon. They wanted to to emigrate, and they needed money. Uh, so this is uh, this is another reason why they returned. In this first uh, first period, they returned because they they were looking for uh, for those who served, for for people they they knew and they they were they loved ones, they neighbors, they their friends who may have survived. This is the it was the I would say it was the first months of the 1945. Um, some of the survivors, and I remember very vividly uh, one of the interviews I did uh, with someone who um, died a couple of years ago in Canada. Uh, he, uh, he was aware that his parents uh, perished but he wanted to see what happened with their apartment and he wanted to see who lived in their apartment. He didn't mention that he wanted to claim it. Uh, he just wanted to, to, to see. And he, it's a very powerful, it was a very powerful moment when in the interview when he described me how he, and this is actually, this is in the book, when he, walks on the main street of this of the city from which the Jews were were uh, were uh, banished f uh, f during the Nazi rule the Jews cannot walk couldn't walk on the on the main street of Radon uh, and he he described how he walks this street and he feels a man he 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 he, he feels a man again or you know it is a young a, a, a very young uh, man that that that's Returned to his city, and he feels that he can walk on this street. That he, and he he reaches his uh, his uh, home, and the windows are open, and there is a hand that is closing the window, and he he cries, "Daddy!" And somebody tells a, 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 a male voice in a very harsh words tells him, "I'm not your daddy. Get lost." And this is like this. Um, this is a very symbolic description because it, it shows the so, sort of uh, hitting the wall. And it was the experience of many of the survivors on, ma on multiple levels. And, um, and I would argue if we've, what we all know about return of survivors in di to different localities, that is not, not only for Rado, it's, it's a typical experience in, in many, other, uh, many other places. So, um, so there were very there were many reasons to return. Yeah, it's actually when when we realize that those people did not know what we know now, it, it is actually possible to return and reverse the question and ask why 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 wouldn't it be 
natural for them to return. Ukash, thank you. Um, we um, are uh, very much in your debt. Um, we have many questions. Uh, I have a surprise here. Um, uh, as we say in Yiddish, a landsman of mine uh, who was asked a question, uh, turns out to be from my mother's city. Uh, his grandparents at least are from my mother's city, Olkush, which is not far from uh, Radom. And uh, one of the purposes of these uh, series, uh, Freighted Legacies, is one, uh, quite frankly, um, it is very important that um, we, the children of survivors, uh, we, the people that are part of the Jewish community, that are part of the Polish Jewish diaspora, 80% of us uh, in America come from Poland, um, uh, understand the issues of finding uh, this common bond of empathy, which you have uh, provided such an important platform on in your work. Um, and uh, I cannot uh, say anything more than, um, along with uh, David Cater, who I want to thank, uh, we are uh, in your debt. Um, it is so important for us to imagine, to sit with you and think with you about all of these issues about return and what it meant to our parents and uh, so forth. Um, thank you so much for your participation. Um, I'm going to ask you a, a question for, that will be a short question, but first I want to make a, a, a short commercial. Uh, and the commercials of two natures. One, this is an ongoing series. Um, and our next um, talk, and I'm going to share a screen here, um, is with um, um, a scholar that um, I'm sure you're aware of, um, uh, Eliana Adler. Uh, whose important book, um, Survival on the Margins, uh, Polish Jewish Refugees in Wartime Soviet Union. Uh, this is a book about an, at least half of the people that came back through Poland um, uh, and who um, came to Radom and many other places searching for family. Um, and that will be our program on March 20th. And we invite people to um, register, you can do that, uh, there, and uh, we look forward to that. And I want to just scroll down to share with you uh, the next uh, program, uh, which will be April 10th. While we're interested in history and while we think history is very important, um, there was a culture that uh, Jews shared, a Polish Jews shared with uh, Catholic Jews, um, and that was um, in part in music. And um, Neil Brostoff uh, will be sharing with us uh, some of the art music of the um, 18th, 19th, and 20th century uh, created by Jews that is part of the uh, culture of the world, part of the culture of Poland. Um, and finally, the program that is not listed, and I'm going to stop sharing just for a moment, uh, is that we're going to um, have a program at that um, in um, uh, May with um, uh, another colleague of yours, uh, Natalia Alexian. Um, uh, and all these questions that we've asked and many more um, are going to be answered uh, fully uh, in the next uh, two, three to 10 years. Uh, we have enough material and we have enough interest. Uh, thank you again, uh, Wukash, for your participation. I do want to make mention of the fact that um, uh, Bet Polska and Friends of Jewish Renewal in Poland um, could um, um, uh, benefit from your support, uh, your sharing uh, uh, the information about the programs we are doing uh, with people. Uh, we are in the midst of organizing an effort to receive uh, people coming from Ukraine. Um, and um, we um, will have information to people about our efforts to um, offer um, help uh, to those people who've made their way to Poland. Um, and uh, uh, please uh, go to our website um, and uh, get on the mailing list so that we're able to share with you. There's a Beit Polska website in Polish. There's a Friends of Jewish Renewal in Poland 
um, website in English. Um, and we uh, uh, are happy to, uh, as Dominica is suggesting, um, make sure that the questions that didn't get addressed um, um, are, uh, you can address them directly to Wukash, who's uh, kindly agreed uh, to, to uh, share those uh, answers. Uh, I wanna thank uh, Wukash once again. I wanna thank um, our translators, uh, the chairman of our uh, group, uh, Marek Yuzovsky, um, our coordinator, uh, Dr. Zakrashevska, uh, board member, David Cater, uh, uh, Marjana Shimanska, um, our translator. Um, and uh, we um, wish you a good day and we pray for peace. Thank you. Thank you very much.